and welcome back to the What The Fork Sunderland Preview Podcast. International break is done and after England notched up two impressive wins, it is time to welcome back the lads in red and white as we travel to Champions-elect Burnley on Friday night. As always, we're going to be here to preview the game and this week we have a podcast debutant in the shape of Joe from Burnley Podcaster Turfcast. Joe, it's not the first time we've spoken, but it's the first time the viewers, viewers, actually no one who watches us, the listeners, um, will have heard of you. How are you doing, Joe? Are you all right? Yeah, really good. Thanks, mate. How are you? Yeah, not too bad, mate. I've got to be honest, I'm not so new here to international uh, break at all, but it'll be nice to get back into um, what should be a very easy game, Burnley away, uh, <laughs> based on the way the season's gone. Look, we'll, we'll start straight from the top. I said in the intro, Joe, Burnley are champions elect, and I think much like Sunderland fans who were old enough to remember sort of 98 and 99 when we won the league with like 105 points, it feels more like a when Burnley win the league as opposed to if... But why has it gone so well? Obviously, you look great from the outside looking in, but you you watch them every week. Why has it gone so well? We're just we're just a very good team um, uh, who play very attractive football. You know, we've signed all the right players, and and I hate using this term, and I'm sure you hate it a lot more than I do. But people were saying Burnley could do a Sunderland and go straight through it into League One at the start of the season, mainly for people like Alex Crook from Talksport, you know, uh, and people who, who work at you know the Daily Mail. Um, but you know, people were saying it nonetheless, uh, and and Blackburn fans are especially going, "Oh, you're going to go down again," and all, all this. Um, but it, we're never really in uh, uh, in any real danger of us doing that. A few people were sort of like complaining about the way that the club were bought under the previous owner and the fact that relegation from the Premier League meant that we'd be 100% skint. But I have never had a reason not to trust Alan Pace, who, who is the owner. Um, and he always said, look, relegation wasn't in the plans, but, you know, we will be fine. We won't, we won't, we won't end up going bust or doing a Sunderland as people and I like to call it. But... Um, we will be fine, and we've been fine. And he's made some good good decisions by appointing Vincent Company. He's backed him. He's got the players that he wanted to be able to play in the style um, that he plays in. So, yeah, uh, basically, we've we've made a lot of right decisions. People would have seen us as well letting James Tarkovsky go. Letting is probably the wrong word, but James Tarkovsky leaving, Ben Mee leaving, Nick Pope leaving. I won't mention where he went. Um, but you know, Maxwell Corner leaving as well. You know, all these players leaving. I was like, oh, Burley, fire sale. The owners got loads of debt. They're gonna go all the way down to League One. It's gonna they're gonna stay there for six years, like Leeds or Sunderland or whatever. And it just it just didn't pan out like that. The chairman was saying, look, it's not that this isn't the case. Um, we we are letting people go because they are on Premier League money. And you know we're making the decision now because wh- wh- why keep older players that are used to losing for the last eighteen months who are on seventy five grand a week you know and don't really want to be there? What's the point bringing young hungry players who want to make a name for themselves in English football? And then we brought in Manuel Benson, Zorore, Josh Cullen, you know Taylor Harwood, Bellis, um, Bayer, you know Teller alone, Markson alone. We've made some brilliant signings, loans and permanents, and it's it's just been apart from the earlier earlier start to the season where we drew a few games it's just been it's my favourite season as a Burnley fan put it that way I don't know we've had better seasons but I think this is my favourite season um, as a Burnley fan Yeah that makes total sense I suppose as well um, You touched number four Vincent Company. I think obviously he's one of the big reasons for the, the change in fortunes and mentality Yeah I suppose now it looks like an inspired Appointment in hindsight, but hindsight's a wonderful thing. I remember at the time thinking, oh, that might not work out, or it could go very Roy Keane at Sunderland when we had Roy Keane in the championship. As it yeah. is, it's it's gone more like the latter than the, the former. But but why has the marriage of Vincent Company and Burnley worked so well? Because that, that was a risk, even though it seems to have worked out now. At the time, it was a risk. I'm not sure. I, I just think, as I've mentioned there, we, we've backed him. We, we've let him bring in the players that he wants. Obviously, I can't speak for um, Roy Keane at Sunderland or, or whatever. I don't know if he were backed or not, but I just I just think he's a good manager um, as well. I, I think he's proven that he's, he's, he's done, you know, he's proven that he's quite knowledgeable. He's proven that he can um, build a team, you know, as he has done. Um, he, he did well at Anderlecht without pulling up any trees. And some people were looking at that, again, without all the knowledge, seeing the fact that they were finishing third and fourth with Anderlecht and go, oh, that's not actually that good. Should be winning the league with Anderlecht, which is ultimately why he got sacked. Um, but when he was brought in at Anderlecht, they had uh, real bad monetary issues. They are in a financial mess. He came in, steadied the ship, got them back up to where they kind of wanted to be, like, you know, battling for the title, but never pushed on and made him a real force in the league. So a lot of people did criticise him for that. But 
Yeah, it's interesting because I when it when he came in, I was like, brilliant. It, he has shown he's done an okay job. I spoke to a lot of Belgian journalists. They were like, oh, I think this could go really well. Um, spoke to an Anderlecht fan. He were a little bit hit and miss. But I like he knows the league, not necessarily the league, he knows English football. Um, he's going to have contacts. Uh, he's going to want to play in a certain style, probably similar to Pep, which I think has been proven that is the case. Um, but I remember being at a wedding uh, in um, June, July, and it was a wedding not in Burnley. Uh, and I was the only Burnley fan there. And I was remember chatting to, it was around the Stoke area, so I'm chatting to Stoke fans, Tranmere fans, Port Vale fans, and I'm all like, Vincent Company, I think he's going to do really well. They're like, all that, I think he'll fail. I don't see how he's, how it's going to work. He's not done a, he's not got enough experience. Um, but ultimately, yeah, it, it's worked. And I, I just think it's the it's the backing. I think I think the chairman's done the right thing. I think we've made a lot of good decisions, as I said in the previous answer, letting people go on the surface of it never always looks like a good idea. But the fact that they've gone uh, and that we've been able to bring in these players because we've made space and because we've had you know a, a, a wage restructure um, I, th- I think I think it's that it's giving company the the chance to bring in the players that he wants. Uh, I think that's the reason why it's gone so well. Yeah, and it, it certainly seems that we're looking looking at it. I mean, I think we spoke earlier in the season on your podcast, and I was saying most of the players at the time I hadn't really recognised, but that's probably because companies picked them as young hungry players that don't really have a name, and as you said before, young hungry players want to make a name for themselves, picked yeah. by someone who's a very good captain who understands how to. Have, you know, get a team functioning, so to speak, and it seems to just work perfectly. But look, this might sound weird after all the perfect beginnings we've spoke about, but you're 16 points clear at the top of the table, so maybe bizarre to mention it. But we do always look back at the last result because I need to give Sunderland a little bit of hope here. Um, a 6 0 thrashing at Man City. Look, Man City, you're not going to play every week, even when you do get promoted. The, the some side in Holland is an alien, but yeah. You played Man United earlier in the season. I actually watched the game um, and you give them a real good go. It was nip and tuck, maybe a bit of quality from Rashford. So where did yeah. it go wrong at the Etihad? Why was it such a big scoreline? Um, we just, I think I think when it got to 3-0, I think the players were just like, sod this, I don't really want to be here. Um, and I think they were really disheartened, um, not because we went 3-0 down, but that's part of it, but because the first half, we were actually the better side. And I remember watching them for the first half an hour. We were playing out from the back at Man City. It was so bizarre. A championship team had gone to Man City and were playing out, beating the press, playing out from the back. The keeper pretty much playing as a sweeper keeper, as he does in the championship, but doing it at Man City. Um, So for the first 20 minutes, half an hour, we were the better side, but without really creating any, any, any chances, but better on the ball than them. I probably had about a similar amount of possession as them in the first half an hour. I'm sure someone could could prove me wrong on that, but it felt like that watching the game anyway. And we, and we weren't really put under any pressure by them that, because we were just doing so well. Like I said, we were beating the lines, getting in behind um, their first press and doing it really well. And I remember watching at one point, um, we passed it around one of the players' triangles and then beat the press. And Harlan was fuming. He was throwing his arms about, that slamming the ground with his feet. I'm like, this guy's getting frustrated here. This could be good for us. Turned out that was horrific for us because obviously he went on and, and, and scored a hat-trick. I think we annoyed him. I think we porked to the bear. And then he's like, right, sod this. I'm um I'm gonna stick three past them. But it was just a couple of, of very minor defensive lapses. And I say minor because it wasn't like a big mistake, like a pass out from the back that went wrong. It was not tracking Haaland for like three seconds, took took the eye off Haaland and then he's in and he's so fast. Like I think you get away with it in the championship because say if you take your eye off. I don't know. A, 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 I was going to say a Sunderland player then, just because I'm playing. We're playing against you, but I didn't want to make it like sound like offensive in that way. But any other team, like any team, like you'd take your eye off their striker, and and then you probably can catch up with him, or probably just get your body in the way, and and then you'll be fine. But because it's Haaland, he was in, and and they just played a through ball to him, and then that was one nil. The second goal didn't take much long after that. I think it was about two minutes forty seconds or something between the first two goals, and that were a bit of a kick in the nuts. Um, and then it got to 2-0 at half time and I remember chatting to people at half time saying we're playing well we obviously we're going to get beat now but you know just keep giving good account of ourselves and then we'll be fine and they scored quite early on in the first half and I think that, that that was just that it I think a lot of the lads were like yeah don't we want to be here and then some of the, the goals after that were just were just poor they were just poor all round but I, I just felt like I just felt like um, we not took our foot off the gas that's the wrong thing but just just throw the towel in to be honest with you um, which is a shame because um, we did give a good account of ourselves for the first half an hour and we gave a great account of ourselves at Man United earlier in the season. So, um, And of course, we beat Bournemouth, a uh, Premier League team um, by name. So, you know, we, we've done all right against the Premier League sides up until that point. But um, yeah, a little bit worrying that we just did switch off. But I think, like you said, it's City. So I'm not overly worried about that result. 
Yeah, Holland's like, I mean, I was thinking before, I was thinking, I hope he doesn't say Ross Stewart here, but to be fair, I don't think you could defend any team in any league by saying they're different to Holland because Holland is in many ways yeah. different. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think we've actually played against Stewart yet this season, have we? He's been injured for no. quite a while. It, it, I can't remember him playing at the Stadium of Light early in the season. Um, I, mean, I might be wrong. Again, I was there. Um, but um, yeah, I can't remember playing against him. You won't have actually played. Sunderland fans will laugh at this. You won't have actually played against a striker for Sunderland this season because we had no strikers then, and we'll have no strikers on Friday. Allegedly, <laughs> um, I think looking at the league form, it's really hard to pick a time when Burnley have not been on form. Yeah, you are, but look at the last five games: three wins from the last five, but the two results that weren't wins draws against Blackpool and Millwall. Look, Millwall away, hard game. Understand that. Yeah, Blackpool may be a surprising one, but in comparison to the season as a whole. Have Burnley took their foot off the gas a little bit, considering how far ahead you are? Or is it just a case of that was one bad result in five and it has been as good all season? Uh, I, I think I don't think we took our, took our foot off the gas, but I don't think we're playing as well as we have done. Um, you said then, like you feel like we've been in form all season, and you know the start of the season, the first ten games, they weren't that good. Um, you could see, but it's uh, it's one of them. Like I, I expected us to start the season very slowly. We started it slowly, so kind of right. But I expected us by Christmas for it to just be starting to click then. Because when you go from, and this is no disrespect, there's no right way of playing football. When you go to a Sean Dyche style of football to what company's trying to do, I'm thinking it's it's going to take a while, is this? It's going to take a while for it all to click. And we kept referring to Burnley um, as when are they going to click? When When's click there? That's what we all kept talking about. Then we beat Wigan 5-1 at Wigan. We're like, oh, it's click there. But I think the result after that was another home draw. And so we just kept, we just kept doing it like two steps forward, one step back. Um, obviously probably my favourite game this season actually no it's definitely Blackburn at home but my favourite away game so far this season was actually at the Stadium of Light and I think I think that was the moment it clicked I think at half time obviously 2-0 down I think his company's gone in there apparently he can he can give a bollock in if he needs to he's gone in there I think he's I think he's proper gone at them because we were poor in that first half but that second half that's when I saw Burn and that wow this team can be really 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 good here um, and as Sorora, um, brilliant goal, obviously the one that made it 3-2, cuts inside, bangs it in the top corner, which annoyingly he's tried to do that in every game since. And that's like, all right, mate, you scored a really good goal there. Stop doing it now. Um, but yeah, we did start the season slowly anyway, is the point I'm trying to make. So without that first 10, 12 games, no, we'd be really knocking on the door of that um, Reading points record of, of 106. Um, I, I, think, I think we're going to fall short, to be honest with you, because we need to basically win every game apart from two, I think it is now. Um, to, to, to get that so I don't think we're going to do it because we've still got to play you I th- you do worry me because I think sometimes you're a side that is very very good and then sometimes you're a side that's a little bit poor but the, the game at the Sunderland at uh, the Stadium of Light is a perfect example of that 45 minutes very good second 45 very poor um, so you do worry me we've still got to play Middlesbrough away we've still got to play Sheffield United at home and we've still got to go to them lot down the M65 away as well so I think there's going to be a couple of defeats in there between now and then so we might fall short of that but yeah since the World Cup we've been fantastic but apart from like the last six or seven games there's just been a couple of poor performances in there City City but Blackpool we just weren't moving the ball quick enough we're just a little bit slow in possession um, we still should have won the game their keeper got man of the match but you know if, if we'd have been playing the way we had been playing and moving the ball quicker I think we'd have won that game because they are a poor side and it's disappointing that they, there's only two sides this season that we haven't beat so far Sheffield United could add themselves to that one's Watford and you think oh, fair enough decent side the other one's Blackpool, so that is quite annoying, especially considering they're a, a Lancashire rival. Yeah, yeah, it, we, it's, it wouldn't have been the team I would have picked it because you drew 3 3 at the start of the season, of course. I forgot about that as well. Um, yeah. you touched on that game at the stadium light, and I think it's hard to kind of like look beyond it. I think I look back to the, the game itself, I didn't have to think that much about my memories of it, but I look back at the table at the time. Um, the win itself put you third. At the time, mm. it put you one point behind, believe it or not, and this will surprise people, QPR, they were top at the time. And then Blackburn... They were really good at first, weren't they? For, yeah. for a bit, QPR. For a bit. Um, <laughs> I think looking back at where you are now as a club, and the amount of points clear you are at the top, you sort of alluded to it a little bit already, but, but how important was that second half performance at the Stadium Light in the context of your season? Yeah, it's massive. I think, like I said, it's my favourite game this season. Um, favourite away game, should I say. Um, I just felt like that was, the first half was just, we were so passive and that's where we, how we'd been in some of the games. Like, yeah, you were playing well, you were pressured us quite well. Um, but that that is the point. Like, we invite the press. That is how we play. We, we say to you, right, if you want to press us, feel free to press us because we'll just pass it around you. We are that good. We'll just pass it around you. 
And I think against you lot in the earlier uh, game in the season, I think we were getting really unstuck by that press and you were putting a lot of pressure on us. Big crowd, as Sunderland always is. I think some of the lads were probably, you know, a little bit worried about that or, or you know, it made them a bit nervous. Um, I can't remember if company made some changes at half-time as well, um, off the top of my head, but we were just so much better in that second half. So he obviously changed things, uh, whether it be tactically or, or personnel or what, but I know it, it, it had gone at them in that, in that dressing room. But yeah, in the context of our season... I think the first half of that game sums up how we played in the first half, well, the, the first part of the season before that. The second half in that game sums up pretty much how we played ever since then, really. Um, <coughs> excuse me, like beating the press, trying to get in behind and things like that. <coughs> Sorry, mate. <laughs> Some spit just went down my throat then. But um, yeah, I think massive, massive in, the, in the context of our season anyway. I think looking back to that game, I remember... As most people know, I've got normally if we're driving, it's like a three-hour journey back. Um, and it was a three-hour journey back. I think we drove for that game. And it was like, I remember specifically after we just got our second, those of you who are familiar with the social media app, Be Real, uh, Be Real went off and we thought, oh, brilliant. It did. In the second. It did. I, I remember mine being fuming. I remember mine being, I'll try and find it, but I remember I was so angry. It went off at half time or, or just That's after right. he scored that second goal. And I, I remember I was, I literally just took a picture of the stand like outwards into the into the football pitch and uh, my face, which was just sheer anger. I mean, I know you don't have any viewers, you don't you won't be able to watch it, but I'll find it and I'll show it you. But yeah, <laughs> I was, I was fuming there, mate. I remember I was fuming in that be real. I remember it specifically, and I think you know if anyone doesn't know what be real is, you can you can soon find it. But basically, it's an app that goes off and you take a photo and yada yada yada. But I remember feeling particularly happy at half time and thinking, "Wow, that's like you know I would have been delighted with a point with two 0 up. We've got no strikers. This is give or take the the best we've played this season." And I think the second second part the the second half obviously you played really really well and it was it was basically just difficult to cope with i don't think the lads were particularly bad it was just hard for us to cope with because you were better um but the one crumb of comfort i had coming back because obviously you're fuming after you've dropped a two nil goal no matter what the, the circumstances are where that company said look Sunderland are one of the best sides we've come up against this season and you thought well you know, in context of where we are in the season, the fact it's our first season, that's a crumb of comfort. It's a really res- like respectable person that's got you know good standing in the game and Burnley are doing really, really well. That's something we can take. Yes, disappointing second half, but yada, yada, yada. And we took that kind of crumb of comfort as best as we could. But from a Burnley perspective, you've come up against some decent sides this season. You've have, you know, some teams have got results against you. But forgetting the second half, <laughs> Where did Sunderland rank in terms of sides you've you faced this season, specifically in that first half? Yeah, in that first half, I think at that point, I, I understand why our company said that. I think Watford played well against us because we had already lost at that point once um, against Watford. I think that was the second game of the season, actually. It may have been third. Um, but they, they they just strangled us and, and didn't let us do anything, whereas you just played us off the park for that first half an hour, pressed us very, very well. Uh, and, and I think I think in the end, like I said, it's it's good that you did that because I think that was our style of play was inviting that press and trying to beat it. So I think in the in the context of our season, it was good that you did did play like that and, and did do that to us. But yeah, I, I remember being at half time. I, I saw one of my old college friends um, in the bar at half time at, at the Stadium of Light. Just and they were like, "Oh, they just I didn't realize how good these would be. Like they're just pressing us very very well, and you know we're losing the midfield battle. That's a problem." Um, and that's why I think we may have made a change at half time. Uh, I'm not sure again, uh, so I'm sure someone will uh, will tell me if I'm wrong. But um, no, you did. Just so, you, you took off yeah. Ashley Barnes and brought on Jay Rodriguez. Well, that's interesting because I would have expected it to be a midfielder. But yeah, um, yeah, I'm just looking at it now. Um, yeah, and brought on Manuel Benson. According to this. I don't know if that I don't know if that's correct, but Manuel Benson, he's he's brilliant, and um, uh, yeah, I think Ashley Barnes was very poor in the first half of the season, and that was another one of his poor performances. Um, but then he got a couple of goals in November against Blackburn, and that kind of kicked him up the bum a little bit. Obviously, made him he's already a legend anyway, but made him a legend again. Um, but yeah, Manuel Benson, he's the type of player that he's been missing a while actually, uh, so he will be missing probably again this weekend. Um, but he's he's a tough play that you need because he will run at your defenders and stretch the play, and then and then you can't press us as easily as you could have done because we we, we stretch into the back. But um, yeah, the first half in that game you were very very good. But I think as soon as we put some pressure on you, I think I think you just cracked. But like you said earlier, you know it's your first season back in this league. I think you've got at that point had had quite a bit to learn, um, and and could only get better really. 
Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think I think it's a really fair assessment. I think it was the first half with everything that's been good about Sunderland this season. The second half, probably where we, I wouldn't say haven't been good, but maybe as you said, where we maybe need to learn. But um, I think one thing I probably definitely need to bring up here now. I've looked really in depth at this because I find it quite interesting. But we touched on Alan Pace previously. Um, yeah. As good as Burnley have been this season, it's not all been good news. At the minute, it's under, I believe, a transfer embargo. I know that Alan Pace says he hopes that that's going to be lifted because I believe it's due to something to do with audit. And I'm not the most business savvy man on the planet, but it's something that could realistically be lifted in the next few months. But I understand as a fan of a football club, I think any football fan would understand this. When you hear about transfer embargoes and things not quite going right in terms of money and audit and all the kind of stuff that we realistically, we don't want to think about as football fans. There's always a little bit of concern. I think without doubt, I hope I'm not jinxing it for you, but I'm pretty certain I won't be. You're going to go up. Um, is there much of a concern within the fan base that that transfer embargo potentially could go into January and you've already seen came up against Man City and potentially second half a little bit of class and there's a little bit of a concern that next season could be a struggle because of that? Not really. I mean, there's a few people worried, um, but these are the sort of people that said Alan Pace would be an asset stripper and just and just put, sell everything off and then run off into the sunset back to Texas or wherever he's from, um, riding with a cowboy hat on with loads of money. Um, as I said before, I've got no reason not to trust him. He came out and said, as soon as this happened, said he's very disappointed the AFL have come to this decision. It's basically happened because when... Because these obviously aren't for the accounts for this year. These are for the accounts for last year, uh, how tax and stuff works, I think. Um, I'm self-employed, I should know that. Um, but it, it's for the previous year's tax when when they bought the club. Um, but apparently what's happened is... Um, since since they've come in, they've changed auditors. They want their own auditors, which I presume will be an American firm. Um, so it'll be something to do with, uh, or so he says, it's something to do with changing the auditors. Like the, the previous auditors haven't given enough information to the new auditors to, to be able to, to get things that they want to do. They fully expect it to be lifted um, in the summer. Um, it's just a case of late submission of tax, basically, or tax documents or whatever it is. It's not like anything untoward. Um, I saw a few people, mainly at rival teams, um, saying, oh, it's because of this transfer and partly it's loads of dodgy stuff has gone on. But like I said, it's not for this year. And they're all saying, like, oh, it's for the Zorori transfer or for the Benson transfer, something like that. Like, it's not for this year, it's for last year. So that's obviously BS because it's not actually for this year. But yeah, it, apparently it is just a case of, Late, late filing of tax, something like that, a bit because of the auditors changing. Now, looking at Friday's game, I've got to be honest, I'm obviously going down. We're going to be packed out again. And I think based on the form and the fact you've only lost two games this season, it's probably quite natural for us to go there and, let's be honest, snap your hands off for a draw. You haven't lost much. Um, but you did lose heavily early in the season against Sheffield United. And I, as you said, at the start of the season, there was a 1-0 reverse against Watford. We've touched on the draw against Blackpool, who nicked a draw against you twice this season. What will Sunderland need to do if we to replicate those teams and, and get some points this Friday? Um, well, Watford, like I said, we didn't beat them even at, even at the turf. Uh, we drew 1-1 uh, with like a... 85th minute equaliser like a really late one I've got thinking like, I can't believe Watford are going to beat us twice like, don't get me wrong on paper they're a good side but they've not been very good this season um, but they, they just they just stopped us from playing they, they, did, they did the same in both games they just strangled us like we like to play football but they stopped us from playing um, very very well it's weird because you see like, I'm giving you I'm sort of giving you the information on how to beat us but like this is what Blackman tried to do and we just we just picked the ball off them like because Watford basically came to us and strangled us, like I said, and were pressing us really high, not letting us get in in behind and things like that. But other teams have tried to do it, and, and we'll we'll just stick to the three past them. Uh, Preston, for example, we beat them three 0 They were just passive, so you don't really want to be doing that. Like some teams just try and sort of like not get in your face and sit back, but we we just pick them off three 0 Some teams will come at you, um, and then you just end up picking them off three 0 because they're not good enough to do that. Whereas Watford were good enough. Um, Best example, the Sheffield United game you mentioned. We, again, it's kind of similar to the game at um, Stadium Alight in a way because we were 2 1 up uh, and then threw it away in the second half. Um, but we were so good in that first half. But obviously, Hecking Bottom went in and they basically just peppered our defenders and our goalkeeper with deep crosses and we just didn't handle it. We just did not handle it. Um, Again, no teams have come to the turf and tried to do that since. I think that 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 the main turning point in our season. I know I mentioned that Stadium Light was a good one. I think I think another one is is that Bramall Lane defeat because 
Murich, our goalkeeper, he got a lot of stick earlier in the season, a lot of it unjustified, just because he's not Nick Pope and doesn't play in a certain way, um, because he plays it out from the back and people over the age of, I'll say 36 because I'm 35, but people over a certain age, uh, they don't like keepers playing like that. It's like, just bloody get rid of it, man. This guy shouts behind me up time. Like, Give me an heart attack, will you? And all this, it's like they can't handle him playing like that. But we've scored so many goals with the way that he plays. Because he will invite the defenders in, we then pass it round them, we then beat in the lines, and then it's like, no, we've only got two lines to get past. Um, but the, the, it's weird. Like, I don't think there's a, a way to beat Burnley. Uh, like I said, Watford just strangled us, but it's other teams have tried to do that, and, and we've we've passed it round them. Um, Chef United, the, the 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 biggest collapse of the season, it was four goals in the second half. Um, they just bombarded the box with crosses. Um, I think the central defence pairing in that game, pairing, sorry, was uh, Bayer and Taylor Harewood Bellis with Murich at the back. I might be wrong. Um, but Taylor Harewood Bellis, um, he's actually quite good in the air. Um, so I don't know why he got exposed so much. Um, but Bayer has improved in the air anyway. Uh, and Murich is now, you know, he's coming for crosses, which is something he didn't really do in the first half of the season. Um, but we have got Ekdal at the minute, who's been playing because Taylor Harewood Bellis has been injured. But uh, Ekdal did play for Sweden last night and picked up a concussion. So I'm not sure if that's you know, going to be assessed over here. And obviously, if it turns out he's got concussion, obviously, I think the protocol's 10 days or whatever. Um, so he could miss that. So it'll be interesting to see who we do have at centre-back. But um, yeah, there's a been a couple of ways to beat us this season, but all the teams have also tried to play that way and then just been beaten anyway. So um, I just think you have to have quality uh, everywhere on the pitch, like Watford do. In terms of going forward towards the game on Friday, I know... As a Burnley fan, you probably feel very confident because of the season, the way it's gone. But it's something seen as a potential banana skin. I know some teams have said that to me previously. Obviously, you'll feel confident against every team, as you should. But um, how are Burnley fans viewing the game this Friday? I mean, I can't speak for everyone, but personally, like I said, I, I think you're a weird side. Like I've watched you before where you've been dreadful and I've watched you before where you've been very good. Um so I do worry that we'll catch you on one, on one of your very good days, but without having the form open in front of me, I think recently you've not been that great. I think your season's kind of like just fizzling out into nothingness. There was a point where you were looking like you might need the playoffs. Uh, that seems to have completely faded away now. Um, so I, I think I think we're playing you from our perspective at the right time. Uh, I think your season's just calmly fading out into nothing. Um, and, you know, there's not much really for you to play for. Obviously, if you put a run together, who knows, you might be one of those, those surprise teams. It is only still March. Um, so I, I, everyone keeps talking about the playoffs and talking about the current four and stuff like that. I, I think Coventry have still got a chance to nick into it. I think uh, Watford or Ips, uh, not Ipswich, <laughs> Norwich. Apologies, any Norwich fans. <laughs> I don't think there's any listening, but I know none listen to mine. Um, but one of them two, you know, they're good enough to stick a run together if they finally sort it out um, and 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 sneak in there. You guys, if you win on Friday, it could be one of these things that really kickstarts your season, and then you go on a late run. But yeah, I, I just feel at the minute your form hasn't been great. Um, I think I did get it up earlier um, while I was, um, yeah, some of the results here. So 1-1 one, one at home to Luton, losing to Sheffield United, beating Norwich at Norwich, that's a decent result. Um, obviously, then there's the 5-1 the at Stoke, which I know would have hurt, then losing at Coventry, losing at Rotherham, drawing at home to Bristol, and then there's a the QPR win. So it's been a little bit miss, hasn't it, recently, the form. Um, so, yeah, I think, I think like I said, the, the season's just kind of fizzling out into nothingness, to be honest. So I think I'm personally a little bit worried, but more confident of a win than I am worried. Yeah, I think there'll be a lot of Sunderland fans listening saying, if you look at when our strikers got injured, that's when you'll notice it, it, it tailed off again. But I think that's a fair assessment, mate. But um, predictions, I'm never good at it. Don't know why I bother doing it, but we always do it. It's format of the show. I've got to stick with it. Um, ugh, you know what? I don't really believe it, but I've got nothing to lose. Uh, I've been to Burnley twice in my lifetime. I've seen Sunderland draw nil-nil twice. I've never actually seen... Yeah, I think I know which road. games you mean, yeah. <laughs> I think we hit the post in like the last minute, maybe. I think it was maybe Patrick Van Aanholt. Um, so I'll say a nil-nil, just you know, to keep up appearances, but it's not a confident nil-nil, but I'll say a nil-nil. Yeah, I found that interesting, that, because when you say, I've got nothing to lose, and then you went on to nil-nil, I thought you were going to say, well, Nick, it won nil, but that's not, <laughs> but this is, but that's not a reflection on Sunderland. It's more a reflection on Berlin, isn't it? But that, that times that I talk to people on my podcast, they say the same things. Like, oh, you know, I, to, I think I think we can get something here. One-one. And, you know, it's always like that, that, even when people are trying to be overly optimistic, that's the best they can do. I, I think we'll win. Um, I'm thinking two-nil. Um, 
we're a weird side. Like we don't thrash anybody. So people sometimes are like, oh, we could end up getting thrashed. Like we seem to beat teams 3-0 a lot. And I think like we take our foot off the gas when we get to 3-0, which has been infuriating because we went to 3-0 quite early against Blackburn. Um, we went to 3-0 even earlier against Preston, obviously both local rivals. I wanted to smash them both. But um, yeah, so there's not, it's not going to be any of that. So anyone's listening worried about getting smashed, we won't. If if we get to three nil, we tend to just sit off you, um, which I do not like. But it just tends to be the way it is. Um, but I think I think we'll win two nil. Um, think that your striker situation um, will play into our hands. Um, we have got a couple of injuries ourselves. Manuel Benson's out, which is very good for you, but he's been out for a while and we've been winning games anyway. Um, Taylor Harewood Bellis, sorry Harwood Bellis, I get shouted at on my <laughs> podcast for calling him Harewood instead of Harwood. Um, he has been injured. Um, but he's played recently for the under-21s a couple of times, so he might be back. Um, if he is back, it's probably because Ekdal is injured, who who's also plays at centre-back. Um, so there'll be a few players missing for us as well. But yeah, um, I think we'll win. We haven't lost at home in the Championship since September 2015, so it'll be a... a um, a st- not not a big shock. I don't want to put it in that. Uh, oh, shock! Someone to beat Burnley, but I mean a, a big sort of like record broken. If you can come to the turf and win, but I'm hoping we get to the end of end of the season uh, without losing a game at home. Because obviously, I've never seen that in my life, and I don't think I'll, I'll, I'll probably ever see it again. So it'll be a shame if we lose, and um, for obvious reasons from my point of view, but for that record as well. Um, but I, I think we'll win, and I think it'll be two 0 Yeah, I said nil nil with a lot of hope, Rod and. A lot of brain power. But um, Joe, nice to have you on officially on the show. Um, I'll be on obviously yours as well. If people want to find obviously your stuff, what you do, where you're at, you do much more than just a podcast. Where can it be found? Yeah, so we do YouTube as well. Obviously, you can get us in audio format if that's what you want. We will be doing a pre-game show. So if you've just listened to this and you want to head over to get... um. I was going to say a Burnley fans perspective, but I'm basically getting your perspective on my show, so it won't be a Burnley fans perspective. But if you want more of Graham and Joe, head over uh, and you could do that right now. Uh, just search Turfcast on YouTube on all your audio providers. Uh, we will be doing a full time show after the game, not on Friday, maybe Saturday because I'm working nights this weekend, so I'll probably do it on Saturday. So if you want to get again, it will be three Burnley fans at that point perspective. If you want to get their perspective on the game if you've won four nil out of you know some random. Miracle. I'm going to call it a miracle. If you win, because you've got no strikers. Um, so if you if you ran in and win 4 0, you want to hear four Burnley fans, three or four Burnley fans just whinging for an hour, then that will be there as well. But yeah, you can get us on YouTube, get us on obviously Twitter, Facebook, and all your usual audio providers. Thanks very much, Joe. Appreciate it. Cheers.